Okay, I think we are ready to get going. Hi, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I can see we've still got some folks coming on, so hopefully over the next minute or two, everybody will have joined. Um, so I'm going to help kick off the webinar today, and um, I'd like to welcome you. It's a webinar around Southeast Asia expansion, people before product. Um, I'm Fiona Carney, so I am um, the COO for Microsoft across Asia Pacific, and I also sit on the board of directors for the British Chamber of Commerce, and, and so hence I'm here to help facilitate the session today and delighted to be here. Uh, it's great to have a diverse set of audience that are with us. We couldn't quite figure out if many of you are based in the UK are based here in Singapore, so maybe as we go through the session, uh, you might be able to have some Q&A and, and share a little bit. We want to make sure that it's as relevant as possible for everybody on the call today. I would like to thank our official event partner, Globalization Partners, for your support in delivering the webinar today. And I know you've also invited along um, Steve, the founder of Asia Market Entry, to join us as well. So just before we start, a little bit of a reminder on what the intent is for today. I think many will have seen this when you signed up, but just to, to refresh our memory, we want to focus on a few core things. The first is around how global business growth will continue uh, despite the challenging circumstances and why we really see remote work as the, the new normal. We want to think about how you can put employees in new regions ahead of your own product or service. So everything from hiring, onboarding, HR management in a different country and talk through what that can look like. Um, share some best practices for expansion from one country to another and how you really get started in a new market. And then thinking about partnering, what are some of the best practices? So why companies that come to Asia need partners in Asia and how to help manage those partners when it comes down to that business model. So please do uh, post your questions in the Q&A. If you've got anything, we'll try and make this, as I said, as interactive as possible. It's, it's not a huge audience today, and so we should be able to have some good Q&A. And to get us started, I'm going to introduce Steve, who is the CEO and founder of Asia Market Entry. Asia Market Entry is a sales and marketing agency that's based here in Singapore. And Steve and the team specialize in helping technology companies prove that the Asia market, um, that there is a business case for having headcount in the region. And during the session, he will provide a number of essential steps, very pragmatic steps on what you can do in order to plan ahead before you place some people in the region. So with that, look forward to the conversation and Steve, over to you. Yeah, hi, hi everyone, and thanks for the introduction, Fiona, and um, thanks to Globalization Partners for the um, for the opportunity to speak and, and Brit Sham, of course. So, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm a Brit. Um, I founded Asia Market Entry about five years ago now, and uh, as Fiona mentioned, our purpose is really to provide a business case for. Uh, companies that are expanding into the Asia region. Predominantly, we will work in with technology companies as a business. But what I want to share with you today is some just pragmatic advice around um, just some of the do's and don'ts ahead of those head, that headcount coming in. And that's why Asian Market Entry and Globalization Partners has that relationship, because ahead of justifying headcount um, in the region, there's, there, are no, there are a number of steps that, that we, would, we would always recommend. So I'm going to take you through that today. So just bear with me while I go through this and go to the next slide. Okay, just a bit of catch up here. So, okay, just a little bit about some of the credentials um, as to why we can speak confidently about this. So the first thing is we are Microsoft's geo expansion partner for the region. What that means is that any uh, Microsoft software partner that sits on Microsoft Azure that looks to get Microsoft's help in the region will be handled by us coming into APAC. Um, two, we work with a number of trade agencies and associations that will also help fast track um, companies from their countries into the region, including uh, the UK, I might add. Um, three is that we'll have a number of customers, both large and small, where sometimes here we might supplement services, but also the vast majority of the companies that we will deal with will be market entry looking to come here for the first time. 
Yeah, and we would also, of course, you know, lean on our network. We have a whole partner ecosystem of, of companies that we will we will help get advisory on and, and lean on for, you know, for certain topics outside of our wheelhouse. Our wheelhouse, as I said, is very much on the sales and marketing and channel execution of getting businesses successful, successfully into the region. And these are just some of the um, some of the companies that we currently partner with or have as customers. From the UK point of view, Tech Nation would be relevant. The Department of Trade, UK and Business Council, um, and we also work with Greensill, the bank, and also uh, Endeavour, another British-based technology company. Okay, so moving on into the best practices, I'll probably spend about fifteen minutes on this. So. So I guess when we talk about the methods of geo expansion, there's a few options here, right? There's fly in and fly out. This is a traditional method for people coming into a new region. We used to see this a lot pre-COVID, um, but of course we can't do that anymore. Another option is to incorporate and relocate, uh, bringing people over to the region, perfectly viable. Another option is to incorporate and hire locally, another option. And another option is frankly to do nothing if the market based on the research done isn't necessarily, maybe Asia isn't the right time for you at that, at that given point in time. You know, or what we try to do is really provide that middle ground to help, as I said, prove that market ahead of going all in with business cases, with board approval for that headcount, with the, with the, um, you know, with the need for actually having people on the ground to, uh, to, to actually have a, a business to run and a pipeline to actually build upon. So if we actually look at what expanding into a new market is, it actually has a number of meanings and it means different things to different people. And, you know, once you've committed to Asia, well, well what actually is expanding into that market? Is it company incorporation in a, in a new market? It, it might be, but doesn't have to be. Is it your first hire? in that new market? Is it opening an office in a new market? In the tech space, it might just be as simple as setting up a regional cloud in a new market. It could be just that you've signed a new partnership or a new distribution agreement in the market. That to many is geo expansion. Or it might be that just that you've signed your first deal in the region and that in itself is also uh, the first starting point of, of geo expansion. But the point here is, is that expansion into Asia can mean many things and um, it doesn't have to be the same and there's no there's no right or wrong answer here by the way there's there's all that they, they all are a, a um, they all have a degree of expansion about them so I'm going to just talk through some of the core pillars that we've got five pillars here about what we would typically do for a company that would come to us and say right Steve we're looking to come into the region um, we've got a X, Y, and Z product. Uh, we are looking for you to build a business case for us so that we can have headcount in that region in a given period of time. What would we do? Well, the first thing that we would do is we would go to do a go-to-market planning exercise. This sounds quite straightforward, but you'll be surprised how many companies simply don't do this. They read about Asia, they see it in the Wall Street Journal or whatever, and they say, great, we're, we're, we're all in, but without actually any, without a great deal of thought about it, other than the fact that it's a great place to visit, and that you know it's perceived to have a lot of opportunity but there's a lot that goes into that you know is the opportunity there really sufficient for the investment actually needed what are your competitors doing in the region something often lost um but that, that, that i see with companies that come to us for our advice what are the what are the target market priorities and how long is a company prepared to wait for success in that region? What's the board pressure on which the, the results are gonna be turned around? If we're realistic, when we set expectation with companies before they're actually gonna start getting their first deals on the ground, and I'm talking about technology here, so you know, forgive me if, if uh, not everyone here is from the tech space, but you know, in the tech space, it's quite realistic to expect a, at least a 12 month period before, um, before deals will start to close. And I've just got a bit of catch up here on this uh, on this delay. What's the selling approach? Is it direct? Is it partners? Is it distribution? What's the, actually the business case to expand? Has that, has that actually been done in terms of what the ROI is based on what the headcounts that's going to be required and the time taken to actually start developing that market? And are you actually honestly ready to expand into Asia? Uh, a lot of companies have come to us and said, well, we want to come to Asia because they do see the opportunity and there certainly is opportunity, but often companies might just simply be too early. They might not have case studies in their home market. They might not have that brand presence at home. 
And frankly speaking, unless there's a business, unless there's a case study or success stories that then they can go and retell in that new market, well, you know, it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty rare that we see companies that haven't conquered their first market first, then be successful here as, as a tip, as, as, a, as a second phase. So, you know, we, we do have to ask that um, to very honest question to, to, to companies coming in. I said, what the, what's the partnering approach? There's various um, options to partnering, depending on what industry you're in. What kind of product localization is required, depending on which countries are, are, um, are, are going to be targeted by, by any given company? And what are the resources required to support that new market? It's not just business development and going out and, go, and um, getting that first revenue through the door. How do you support that? How do you then go and implement those services? How do you then support those new distributors that you brought on? How do you market that? And along with all of the operational red tape that goes with that. And then finally, and very importantly, what's the pricing going to be based on the Asia, uh, based on the Asia market, which might be very different depending on which country you're, 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 you're looking at. And you know, bear in mind, if you look at Asia geographically, there's 49 countries in, um, in Asia. Um, not that they would, they would all be a typical target market, but nonetheless, that's a lot of countries which potentially might involve 49 different price models. Okay, so that's the first thing that we would typically do as a baseline. And then we talk about marketing and internationalization for companies. Again, I'm, I'm assuming all of this is kind of before headcounts come in. And these are all things that we can do long before that um, a board is going to approve the headcount that will ideally come through a globalization partner type, um, type, type initiative. But the marketing internationalization and the brand awareness for companies is possible to do from a distance or with regional help. And this is just really, really important um, advice, I think. First of all, Asia is not a place to just paint with the same brush. You can't just say, well, this is gonna be our Asia approach. Um, or you can't say, well, I'm gonna take my existing approach in Asia and just assume that Asia is going to be as one. There are gonna to need to be very different approaches from a marketing point of view for each of those different countries. I mean, I say that there's 49 um, different countries. I mean, there are geographically in the Atlas, um, but realistically, if you look at our Southeast Asia and North Asia, and I'll include Australia and New Zealand, you're probably looking at a market of about 15 realistic target countries, you know, from a developed or you know, emerging standpoint. And that's just a lot of markets considering that they're gonna have different pain points, they're gonna have um, different audiences, and it's just important to know that your marketing story has to be relevant for those different audiences in those very different countries. Those case studies are really, really important. We advise that whenever companies come to region, they find the most relevant case study to the region. It might be to a pain point of the region, or it might just be with a customer that they already have in perhaps the UK or elsewhere that just has some kind of a presence here, something that can tie that story to the, to the local market, assuming that they're not here, of course. We'll also, of course, advise around seminars and webinars, or although I think we'll all agree that this is somewhat, um, you know, a lot of people are getting somewhat webinar fatigue at the moment. I'm sure that will come back, and I'm sure that everyone's um, absolutely chomping at the bit to actually get back in a room and start doing these kind of sessions back personally again. I'm, I'm sure that will happen, you know, perhaps next year. Network building and personally and on social is obviously a bit of a given. Uh, the network building personally is a bit challenging at the moment just because of the, the lack of travel and or even the network events that we would typically do with Britsham have largely been stopped. So, you know, the social media um, presence that companies have to have now is just never been more important. It's really the only way outside of one-to-one -one Microsoft Teams or, or Zoom calls that, um, that you can build a relationship. So we put an incredible amount of emphasis on uh, the social presence. It's really the only way we think uh, that um, companies can really start building a relationship and getting to know you. I mean, that does extend to websites as well, but the social media and LinkedIn in particular is just front and center for, for, for us. Of course, it also means leveraging existing database and customer contacts where there are companies that already have a customer in the UK that's perhaps a multinational. It's a given that we will say, well, who can we then go and target in region or even if we don't perhaps know that person? It would also be uh, companies would also need to be aware that for certain markets, but perhaps not all markets, they will need to have translated collateral. When I say I put a, I put a technology angle on this generally, but as I said, as I go through these points, they're largely relevant for the same uh, for, for all industries, um, uh, if you ask me. And not all markets in Asia do require translated collateral. Um, English is largely spoken every, in most places. 
I would say it's very different up in Northern Asia where that's required. But again, just understanding where you need to have that translated con content and where you don't, or at least where you need to phase it in is just another important consideration before actually doing it. Again, going back to that point about social presence, we just find it really important that companies have to humanize their brand and so that we can actually really try to get to know you versus it just being a, a LinkedIn article share or a, you know, just some, some data points. I just think putting a, putting a personal touch to companies coming into the new region is really important if you're really trying to get a new market to get to know you. And that includes building a local microsite. So we always pretty much insist that when companies come to us and say, well, how can we get into this market? How can we build pipeline? That they have at minimum an Asia-based landing page. And that might just be imagery of Marina Bay Sands or you know, Raffles Hotel or just something which is local that shows that the company has considered Asia as a, as a region that they're invested in, including an address, including a case study that's relevant to Asia, including some Asian faces, I mean, it sounds so basic, but you'd be surprised how many companies don't do that. And when we're going out and driving pipeline on behalf of our companies, it's really important that we can then go out to those um, customers and then point them to a public space, a corporate space, which represents strength in the region, even if it's just a single landing page. Educational white papers are also important because, of course, we, uh, the, a lot of the region will be, especially in the tech space, will need to be educated on perhaps new use cases, new tech in the region. So we spend a lot of time advising on that. And we've also just realized, especially during the camp pandemic, that we've really had to embrace video, not just for one to one calls like this or webinars, but also in the way in which we communicate in terms of marketing, you know, less of the static PDF sending out presentations much more trying to engage audiences with you know, two minutes or less snackable bites of content, which are punchy with a face to them, you know, preferably prof professionally reduced, which is gonna resonate with, uh, with the audience. And then of course, the last piece is the part, create partner collaboration tools. And I'm gonna to talk about that next. So I'm just watchful of time here. So um, we've also, um, the partner and channel management um, area for the tech space is particularly important, but I think it's no really different for any, any product that's um, coming into the region. And certainly if you're selling a physical product or you know, F&B or anything, you're gonna need some form of distribution or channel model to, uh, to, to be successful. But you know, the first question is, well, do, do you actually have a partner program? The idea that you can come and conquer 49 countries, or even if it's just 15 in that you know, more realistic setting um, without partners, you, know, you better have you know, pretty big pockets to be able to do that. Um, and in, even you know, Microsoft, as Fiona will tell you, you know, they've largely built their book business on a fantastic partner ecosystem by doing that because even you know, giants like that you know, really can't have people in every single one of these markets. So having a partner program of sorts is just really, I would say essential for, for many parts of Asia what's in it for the partner now these would all be things that would typically be governed by the partner program but you know have you think have you considered what the margin is have you, have you considered what actually the value is for a partner to distribute is it just margin are there ancillary things around that partnership that, that, that they may take benefit from it's important to be able to communicate that out to new partners if you want them to distribute your product do you actually even have partner contracts and even if you do are they actually relevant for the Asian market and based on Singapore or any other country um, jurisdiction? Again, this is, um, this is just red tape, but necessary red tape. Also, what level of marketing assistance will you provide? You know, when we're, when we're going out, selling out to partners for, on behalf of our customers, it's really important for us to be able to enable those resellers and distributors with the latest and greatest content at a local level. But often, especially in the case of the large distributors, they might have you know, hundreds, if not thousands of resellers or even their own salespeople. You know, how do you actually keep them engaged? How do you keep top of mind when you're trying to get those partners to, um, in a brand new market, understand and know that your product is even in their portfolio, bearing in mind that a lot of these companies will have hundreds of products in their portfolio. So it's really important just to, that there's, you know, quite a significant amount of marketing and sales enablement budget available to ensure that those partner channels um, are, are enabled. It's no good just signing these partners and saying, well, good luck. They need to be kept in touch with on a daily basis, much like an extension of your own sales team. What sales tools we have also have available to partners, this might just be the investment in some um, common collaboration tools in which to, which to collaborate. Microsoft Teams would be just a great example for that. 
is the pricing clear for the market and which margins are understood? It might be that there are different tiers required for different regions. In, in Asia, generally, I, I can, as a, as a broad brush rule, put into three different tiers of pricing. There's countries which will pay, as a, I'm talking technology here, so forgive me, but you know, we very much put Japan and Australia in the top tier, as well as Singapore and Hong Kong probably. And then there's a number in that middle tier and I'll include China in that. And then there's a number in the lower tier and that would be based on like developing regions and, and even India to a point. Also, what part of enablement store do you have? I think I covered that in the last point. But another really important question is, well, if you're gonna sign all these distribution partners and, and, and try to go to market that way, well, how do you communicate with those partners? How does each people in the organization do that? It's not just a case of just having one person on the ground being able to, to handle that, or perhaps even from, um, you know, from your home office in, in, in the UK. You know, when deals start getting closed, lots of parts of the business also have to communicate with these new partners. And that in, in, the, in the technology world, that will include support, professional services, it will include legal. It will be the same for any product really, but are they even aware that these new distribution partners have, have come in? So my point here is that it's not just about signing new partners, the business needs to be on board because at the end of the day, lots of parts of that business are going to ultimately end up engaging with that new channel of yours. And another key question is where really, well, how do you channel that? How do you handle channel conflict? It, it certainly happens, especially in smaller markets. Again, what sort of sales assistance will you provide? Not just in the case of man time and being able to actually support these partners on, on their deals, but also in the form potentially of marketing rebates and funding and, and such like to drive their products. Next point, again, on lead gen, just focus on time. I think I'm good. Um, so on the lead generation side, so we talked about the marketing piece. We talked about getting the channel ecosystem in peace. We've already done the G, we've already done the GTM planning. Well, it's not just about partnering. You know, there's certain markets that you will still want to do your own direct lead generation. And again, we'll uh, it, you're not going to want to do that in all countries because in some countries it's pretty much mandatory to have a partners uh, have partners in place. And even from a language point of view, there are going to be some countries, frankly, that are just simply going to be easier than others. And I'll put Singapore in the relatively easy bucket for that. But it's important when you're going out and doing that in parallel to the partnering and in parallel to the marketing work that you do go out and actually list out what those target countries are. As I said, there's a lot to choose from. And it's important just to have that pretty, pretty much listed and understood that, that they are the countries in Asia that you're going to target. It's not just a case of we're going to Asia. It's, it's much more... Um, it's much more detailed than that. Also, what's the target segment? What are the actual industries that we're actually gonna go after within each of those countries? And what are the roles specifically within those industries, within the customer, within the prospects that we're looking to target that we actually want to, want to address? And really importantly, again, these pain points that we're going to be talking about from the, again, really going back to the marketing story, being able to successfully articulate different pain points to different roles in the same organization will dictate um, largely how successful your lead generation campaign is. It's not just a case of just one message uh, fits all and getting everyone to come onto webinars. It has to be much more targeted than that. Asia will be you know, inundated with companies coming into Asia right now, uh, coming, to, uh, coming to the region. So it's really important that if you're going to go out and start talking to these companies and you're talking to specific people in, in specific roles that you really do truly talk to their specific pain point it's not just a case of a template for for for, for all or, or one single messaging for all it takes a lot of work and in some cases if you're sending a linkedin navigator request or if you're sending an email for example it might be that you send 10 different emails with 10 different stories to 10 different roles in the same company and again, I can't emphasize how important that is because very few companies do actually do that. Asking about what's actually causing the pain and also trying to address, well, what capabilities does your product have that's actually being able to map to that pain point? And again, that's really just talking about which of the, you might have different capabilities for the different pain points for those different roles. But again, it takes some homework. It takes some serious account mapping this, but often if you're new to the market, you're going to get one shot at going into some accounts. And if you haven't done your homework or if you haven't made your story relevant to that particular individual, well, you might not get another chance of that. 
And in small markets like Singapore, you just can't afford to do that. You've got to have this story absolutely on point before you do that, or otherwise you can uh, somewhat waste your time. And that includes having a clearly understood elevator pitch, a clearly understood value proposition, a local credentials, which kind of somewhat comes back to the marketing story that, that, that I talked about before. Um, just being able to showcase that you do have a standing and, and deserve to be in the room. Um, and methods of outreach also need to be understood in terms of, is it LinkedIn? Is it Navigator? Is it by phone? Um, is it just social, digitally? There's many, there's many ways, right? But again, these are, these are just things that really need to be understood. And it might be that for different tier of industry or different priority of role that you're targeting, you might have different methods of outreach depending on who you're, who you're targeting in terms of high, how high a priority they are and how high a priority that particular country market is. And also have a realistic target. Well, what actually do your does your pipeline need to be? And you know, based on your home closure rates, well, if your pipeline is X, you know, typically, if you're looking at historical numbers, you know, what sort of closure rates can we expect? Because then, once you've done that, then you can start putting targets in place and revenue forecasts. And um, you know, perhaps with Asia, it does take a long time to close those first deals. But having those targets understood. You know, based on prior experience and based on your, your historical data. It's just important from an expectation setting exercise when you're going to your CEO or to your board in terms of just um, letting them know that Asia is a land of opportunity, you know, but there's a lot of work that goes into making that happen. And then my last slide here, which is really segueing into, into uh, Charlie's piece. Remember, our job at Asia market entry is really to, as I said, help prove the market. With, we, we'll do that on a customer's behalf, we'll do that alongside them. But really, we're trying to get them to a point that they say, right, that's great, we're into the market, we've signed our first few deals, we've got a new channel ecosystem, our marketing story is on point, we're getting new pipeline. Now we're ready to put people in the region because we've done that and we've been able to get board approval for that first people on the ground because we actually have a business case, we have that revenue booked to be able to have that. And these are just some of the operational setup um, uh, um, points that we come across. But frankly speaking, when these questions come up, we will largely refer these over to, um, to, to Charlie and team to, um, to, really, to, to really take through. But just some of the considerations is, where do you actually need those entities? Where are actually you getting success in the market? You know, is it Singapore? Is it more than one? Is it more than one country within um, Asia? It might be, it might not be. What are the tax and regulatory implications? Do you even do you want to book revenue through that country or are you still happy booking revenue through your, your home market? There are tax benefits, but there are also tax implications to doing that. Have you considered bank accounts? Bank accounts are necessary if you want to do payroll and things like that. Certainly you need a bank account if you want to book revenue through that country. And bank accounts these days, um, due to uh, money laundering and, and, and all of the, the compliance rules around this, they take a long time. It can easily take six months to open up a bank account in some countries these days. And that needs to be factored in from a timing point of view. Have you considered the cost of relocation and schooling and so on? It can be seriously expensive, especially in places like Singapore. Um, local directors are required. Uh, sometimes they will not be part of the team that is being relocated. So again, this might be a third party. From a compliance point of view, is your company ready to do that, given that that local director might not be on payroll? What's the visa process, especially during uh, uh, COVID, this has been particularly challenging in terms of getting employment passes and so on in Singapore, but you know, across the board, and it's different country by country, visa processes can be incredibly challenging. And again, this will be one of the things that I know Charlie will talk about in terms of taking a lot of these um, issues off your hands. Payroll is another thing. You need to probably need a third party payroll provider, unless you're gonna be putting your own finance groups on the ground. Um, there's some pretty significant insurances, including things like indemnity and so on, which you need to be aware of and need to be budgeted for. Um, and I think lastly, what do you actually need to pay people and how do you actually attract that talent? And a place like Singapore, I can assure you that the, um, the job market is pretty buoyant at the moment, even during the pandemic. And, you know, it's, it's pretty competitive and it's, uh, it's just really important to understand, well, you know, just because you've got a great brand in the UK or elsewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to jump at that opportunity. They've got a lot of opportunities uh, out here at the moment. And one of the reasons why we help build a pipeline for them and ahead of doing this is so that when the first people do come on to, into the ground, they actually have a pipeline that they can actually walk into and start to cultivate themselves for, instead of it being from a standing start. 
So anyway, that's my session there. I think I went a little bit over time there. Apologies for that, Charlie. But um, hopefully that was useful and could be applied to different industries. But uh, back to you, Fiona. Um, and uh, yeah, hope it was hope it was useful. Great, thank you. You can take a well-deserved break there, Steve. I think that was an awful lot of uh, of information download. So look, great to hear. I think, you know, you've covered some great things from the market planning to the partnering, the lead gen, and then of course, all the operational elements of actually making business happen once, once you're set up. So I think that was good. Um, I don't see any questions, but let me just pause and see if there's anybody who wants to come off mute. If there's anybody who wants to ask anything in particular, now is the time if you've got anything on your mind. No, I'm going to give that. I'm going to give that a a no for now. If you do, um, yeah, we will come back to you on the presentation, Bridget. Thanks. If there is any other questions, please just either pop them in the chat or, or into the Q and A, and we'll we'll come back to you on that. Um, so listen. Next up is Charles, and thanks Charles again for being with us today. So Charles Hamilton is, um, as you know, working with Globalization Partners. And again, they're really a vehicle for essentially hiring where you may not have a presence. That's what it really comes down to. And ultimately trying to make it easy for organizations to get set up in a new market, provide faster time to value, et cetera. So without further ado, Charles, over to you to take up from Steve and, and look forward to listening to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Terrific. All right, so uh, again, thank you uh, to, to Britt Cham uh, and, uh, and to Steve for kind of the, the, the setup around this narrative. Um, what I'm gonna walk you through um, quickly so we can get into some, some Q&A uh, is, is really an understanding primarily about um, the, the talent acquisition space um, across uh, the Asia Pacific region um, that we're operating in here. Um, but most specifically, just some highlights around uh, trends and themes that we're seeing um, with the clients that we serve uh, across the entirety of, of the world, but most germane perhaps to, the, to this crew is what's going on in, in, in ASEAN. So um, the, the context here is um, specifically uh, looking at, uh, we, got, we got, some, got some funk going on with my uh, presentation, just one moment. So what, what we're looking at specifically is what has changed between the year of kind of um, reckoning and assessment that we all went through in 2020, as we now start to look forward into uh, the remainder of, of this year, what is what is even the past you know uh, seven weeks exposed us to, as the markets have shifted, as as changes have been so rapid, um, even with the the good news and the silver lining around. Um, you know, new trade agreements that are burgeoning all across the world and, and, and in this region particularly with the rollout of uh, the vaccines. Um, and it, I can't believe I'm saying that, but vaccines, plural, uh, and all the different things that are kind of testing uh, our company's ability to respond, um, testing our readiness and our, our resiliency. And, you know, equally, if not more important, those that are testing us professionally and personally as employees and as as, as citizens of the world. Um, as you see here in this, in this first slide, I talk about the fact that resiliency is going to be key for companies as they start to look at how they're going to grow. I think it's, it's bandied about uh, quite a bit, this term resiliency. Um, you know, the capacity to recover from a difficulty, um, you know, being tough, uh, psychological resilience, the ability to you know, cope with crisis and get back to whatever normal might be for you. This is a, a, a character set that certainly has um, created sort of a Darwinian moment for a lot of companies. Uh, and I would suggest to you as you're going out and um, you know, scanning the market uh, in what I call 21st century talent spotting, that this particular red thread of uh, characteristic and examples that you're going to wanna to be looking for in talent are, are critical as you go through the process of um, acquis uh, acquisition for, for new team members. So before I go further into this detail, I, I, I think it's important for me to 
at a very high level explain to you a little bit of the nuance between what Globalization Partners uh, does vis-a-vis um, -vis that which uh, Steve uh, discussed with uh, Asia Market Entry. Um, once you have perhaps gone down the path in the model with AME, with, with, with Steve's business, and you've built enough proof in the market that there's, that there's pipeline, that there's actually gold in them, there are hills, uh, the, the next logical step for a lot of companies is to find talent and localize that talent in a particular market. It could be the case, um, as Steve mentioned uh, in, in one of his slides, that you're doing a, a methodology where you're taking someone from your home country and dropping them uh, out into the region. I'm conscious of the fact that there are probably folks on this um, webinar with us today who are based in Singapore, and it very well could be the case that you're interested in perhaps going the other direction. So placing some folks in, in the UK, um, it could be that you're uh, exploring opportunities in um, other parts of uh, Southeast Asia or North Asia. The reality is that global growth is um, uh, compounding and expanding at a rate that we haven't seen in quite a long time. And uh, when you find the, mar the market that you actually want to penetrate next, um, and you've already proven out your business model and it has, it has gas in the tank, in order for you to hire that individual in, in a traditional method, you would need to have an entity in place, a legal structure, a vehicle to compliantly hire an individual or a group of people to therefore um, get them onto local uh, payrolls to ensure that you're providing um, compliant statutory um, benefits, regulatory compliance, um, and just to administer the human resources element of managing uh, talent in a respective market. That's the traditional method. Uh, for globalization partners, the, the model that we put into the market is called employer of record. We exist in 187 countries around the world. We've been operating for about 10 years, um, very prevalent across all the key markets uh, in, in Asia Pacific, certainly. And what we provide for is essentially a, a local compliant vehicle that will go out and hire the individual that you've uh, identified on your behalf, put them into our um, existing uh, infrastructure, uh, apply their payroll and their stat benefits, et cetera. And they're up and going in as little as 12 hours. Um, Steve mentions uh, uh, you know, a couple of the gotchas you have to consider as you look to formally institute your presence in a particular market. Some of those do take you know, months or even you know, beyond a year to get right. Um, an example might be uh, China where you know, 12 months to sort of institute your wholly foreign owned enterprise structure, and then an additional six plus months to get your bank accounts and all these things uh, uh, sorted and set up. You could have uh, talent on the ground in that time, already doing the work that's required to build out the, you know, the supply chain and, and the partnerships and uh, public relations and all the sort of the business development that might be required. And then we would simply take that individual off of our vehicle and put them onto your newly formed structure once it's ready to go. So that, that's, that's just an example. The, the flip side of that is talent now is, is all over the world. And what's really exciting about that statistic uh, that, that, that talent is everywhere is that um, you have this unique opportunity now to hire talent anywhere in the world where it exists. And I'm gonna go in, into another slide here shortly and talk about why that's important because of some shifts that are happening in the demographics of the talent pool that you need to be aware of. In line with that, um, this sort of period of time where a lot of companies have retracted or have kind of gone back to the drawing board and, and trying to design new routes to market, new ways to be effective, they're really looking at um, new territories. Now, I, I think, again, uh, by probably within the next you know, three to four years, China will probably be the largest economy in the world. It's, it's a, a foolish and naive to suggest that you would want to divest yourself of any supply chain uh, dependencies um, holistically that you might have with China. But clearly as countries, China included, have you know, locked up um, some trade, they've locked up some uh, uh, borders and, and uh, uh, you know, immigration uh, processes, you do need to build resiliency into your supply chain. And that means your talent supply chain is, as well as it means um, you know, where your technologies might be developed, um, where you put your cloud, uh, where your actual manufacturing might be, and a huge amount of uh, focus over the past uh, six to seven months, particularly with the re recent uh, RCEP trade agreement that was signed between ASEAN plus, plus five other countries. 
um, a lot of the focus is on Southeast Asia. And why that's exciting is because there is this unique opportunity to have first mover advantage to get into these markets, find your talent and get them started very quickly and do it in parallel in multiple markets to assess where you're going to get the highest return on investment, find the best talent, and then exploit those opportunities. So altering your supply chain story is just another version of globalization. Um, it, it means building you know, uh, capabilities into your, uh, your network that heretofore probably were on the back of your mind. A lot of plans that people had, that companies had pre the pandemic have just been accelerated. So that's something to bear in mind. And what's, what's really exciting about that in addition is that as you go into these newer markets, particularly those new emerging markets um, uh, around the world, you're finding access now to talent that heretofore was just not even on your radar. It's uh, the statistic from uh, uh, the Oxford Talent Institute states that there will be 56% uh, of the global uh, uh, college uh, level uh, graduates will be in emerging markets um, starting from this year moving forward. So it's already the case that uh, settled markets or more mature markets are you know, really having to scramble to, um, to reskill and to upskill. And what's fortunate for the emerging markets particularly is that they have not, um, you know, uh, I would say what necessity is the mother of invention They've had to be innovative from the get-go and they've skipped a lot of generations of technology debt and other aspects. And thus the talent is really, really uh, resilient and, and highly sought after. So you can see just from this little map um, that the, uh, the growth and talent trends around the world, you're really starting to see a surplus of talent in markets which heretofore probably you didn't consider. And the good news story here is that instead of setting up in those markets, um, in order for you to compliantly hire that talent, because you can't travel and all the other restrictions that are in place right now, you can use a vehicle like an EOR to hire those folks. And it very well could be the case that you're not interested in that market as an expansion market in, unto itself, but there's so much you know, valuable uh, talent available in that market. You now have a, a methodology and, and a way to get into that market and uh, uh, exploit that opportunity. So. The, the scenario is, is also really important to understand um, how it impacts your business as we become even more globalized than we were in the past. And I say this because the diversity that you can bring into your uh, culture as a firm, um, the ability to take on new types of skills, uh, the, the sort of, you know, the world opening up to a lot of new merger and acquisition type opportunities as well, which we can discuss in, in the, in the Q&A. There's a litany of reasons why it's a really great strategy to be doing uh, talent spotting outside of your own domestic market. Again, the market opportunities are there, um, but the talent opportunities, this is probably in, in our lifetimes, singularly the most um, unprecedented moment in history to find uh, talent that, that heretofore was just simply not available, not least of which because of these um, demographic shifts, but also because of the fact that there's a lot of people who are you know, in, in, a, in a period of disruption and they're going into new, uh, into new uh, phases in their career where they might be open to opportunity. And I'll, I'll leave you with this sort of um, story. If you think back to the end of World War II uh, in the United States, there was a small uh, technology computer company that was you know, struggling because a lot of the talent was not available. The talent was being deployed into you know, sort of the, the military uh, machinations during the war to provide for uh, engineering and all the various you know, technology advances that were required to keep the machine moving. When the war ended and there was a, a fairly significant um, economic impact to that, that tail off um, in, in the mid 1940s, a huge influx of um, engineering talent became available. And the small company is a company called Hewlett Packard. And I'm sure you all heard of HP. And they made a very recent decision, which was, hey, you know, while the market is down, we have uh, enough uh, confidence in our model and our business. We have this unprecedented access to this talent. We're going to make this investment and bring this talent on board. And I would suggest to you that that, that decision almost singularly um, allowed them to build the foundation for what soon became one of the world's you know, most preeminent uh, technology uh, firms. So you know, think about the fact that while you have this opportunity with all this available talent and 
easy ways to test the market without going full on. Um, AME is one example of that. Um, Globalization Partners is another. And all these free resources that are around you, BritCham is a phenomenal organization to liaise with, to get insights and plug into uh, networks um, and, and trade agencies, et cetera. So all of this is at your disposal. And uh, we're quite excited to, to help you explore these opportunities and see the growth going you know, back to Europe and Europe into the region and intra-regionally as well. So I'll leave you with that and uh, turn it back over to Fiona. And we can go into some, some Q&A. Great. Thanks, Charles. Really interesting. Fantastic perspective, I think, from both. And I think we are getting a few questions about just being able to share the material. So hopefully we can follow up on that. Um, but maybe let's just open it up. I think there's been a massive focus of content there, a lot to take in, I think. Um, but is there any any questions from anybody in the audience or just even any comments or thoughts that you'd like to share or anything that would be useful to follow up on? So is the support only for non-SEA Southeast Asian companies? So is it really open to people outside of SEA or is it also available for companies who are who are based here already? I guess I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, look, the, the employer of record model that I that I discussed from from, uh, from globalization partners is, is, a, is a globally um, available service. So we, we serve clients, you know, all, all over the world. We have thousands of professionals that we um, hire on behalf of the ultimate employer. Uh, and so I would suggest to you that, you know, really the, the world is now your market. And um, with all of this um, economic uh, investment that's going on, um, particularly by, by governments in, in trade, I mean, you think about the fact that uh, it, we think about, you know, um, uh, Britain as an example, um, the UK is, is going to be a massive uh, contributor to a lot of the recovery um, that's already very um, obvious here in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, in, in 2019, the UK clocked $35 billion of trade between ASEAN and the United Kingdom. So, I mean, that's, that's a fairly phenomenal amount of uh, trade, but it's not as if ASEAN is the only market out there. Um, Africa is, 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 you know, on an explosive track of growth with a ton of investment in infrastructure. Um, Europe, uh, I, I, would, I would suggest, um, not being an expert, but I would suggest that the change in the relationship between the UK um, and the uh, European Union, well, it's, it's you know, fraught with a lot of challenges. Also with that, the, the opposite is true. There's a ton of opportunity as well. Um, the United States is probably one of the number one um, receiving regions for the businesses that we serve in Asia who are exporting their uh, business ideas and concepts into uh, uh, out of region, it's going to the United States. So there's a ton of opportunity. Um, it's not only um, you know, restricted to, to one particular region. Great, thanks, Charles. Anything else, folks on the, on the line? Any other comments or questions? I guess maybe just uh, in the interest of, of follow-up, Charles and Steve, is there anything you could recommend for the audience if they want to find out more or, you know, is it just best to contact you on LinkedIn? What's the best approach for people? So, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would suggest to you that for sure uh, uh, on the website, uh, both Steve's uh, companies and, and our website, we have a ton of resources available. Um, we have something on uh, the globalization website called Globalpedia, which is a, a resource you put in the country and pull down all uh, current information about setting up, about taxes, about employment law, about you know a, a litany of different sorts of resources there. That's a free resource. You can just pull that information down. Um, absolutely reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, I know Steve and I both uh, are, are tremendous fans and we're very, very active. So um, happy to connect. And you know, here's the thing too. If you're, if you're even scratching the surface or, or even remotely considering um, either retaining talent or, or attracting talent somewhere, or you're just kicking the tires on a particular market, you know, reach out and if, if it's too early or if you're a different stage or what have you, we can always connect you to people who can help. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Our job, you know, and I speak for Steve as well, you know, we, we serve, we live to serve because the, the rising tide is gonna lift all the boats. And I think more than ever, the business communities around the world need to, if they've got a hand, they need to reach out 
and pull people up. There's so much free information that's available out there. University programs, incubators, accelerators, companies like Microsoft um, who have tons of resource to help companies to navigate um, the challenges that, that, are, that are being faced, but also take advantage of opportunities that are, that are uh, becoming more and more prevalent. Um, it's, it's, there's really no excuse not to you know, get in touch and find access to this information and make informed decisions. Yeah, yeah. and I'd, I'd, I'd also add just um, from my side, you know, we, you know, I think I speak for Charles as well. You can tell from his, his the way he's come across, it, it, neither of these are sales pitches. And at the end of the day, you know, from our point of view, we know very much we're firmly focused on the tech sector, right? And we know that most of the world is not that, <laughs> but it's our duty, um, especially as, um, you know, as, as, as being British and as part of our role in market expansion for a number of government agencies across, um, a, a, from across the world in Singapore, to Charlie's point, really be, you know, we'd like to think a central piece of that community that if you do have questions around any number of topics, it might not just be around the pieces that we've talked about, it might be around just the recruitment piece, it might be about the logistics, it might be about, you know, just relocation of what school you need to go to, whatever. You know, it's not in our interest to not help. And, you know, we, Singapore is way too small to, to, uh, to not do that. And so please do what, whatever industry it is, whatever product it is that you're selling, whether you're here and need help or introductions, if you want to get some help, um, perhaps getting introduced to some of the other international trade agencies that are out there. Yeah, we're always there. We, it's, uh, it is a community. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's why we're all here supporting Britcham and, and also globalization partners in this case. Well, I think that is a very nice open offer to leave everybody with, Steve and Charles. So thank you. And I know, Steve, nothing to do with the fact that I happen to work in Microsoft, but I know you will be full of uh, content and knowledge about the programs we have and various different things that are available for people as they think about starting up. So um, absolutely leverage that. We do have one more question. Charles, uh, so do globalization partners specialize in certain sectors? Do you have any industry focus, Charles, or any sector focus? We do not, uh, we're, we're completely agnostic and we, we work with companies from, you know, the far end of the spectrum, like food and beverage, all the way to, you know, fast moving consumer goods, technology, manufacturing, et cetera. It's where, where we see the most amount of sort of interest and, and the companies that are uh, most uh, agile and taking uh, advantage of these opportunities are these days, we typically see uh, software services, online services, um, technology players, I'd say, in this region, probably 60, 68, 72% of the companies that we um, uh, work with are tech firms, classically saying tech firms. 90% um, of the companies we support are uh, venture capital or private equity backed firms. Um, and that's interesting to understand that, you know, I mentioned the market entry use case, the, the talent acquisition use case. The other story is a lot of, um, you know, use private equity as an example, they make an acquisition of, a, of an asset and they want to test a particular market. They bring the talent and drop it onto our vehicle and we help them to test. Or if they found that um, if you're in involved in an M&A, as an example, you buy the asset and find as you're unpacking it, there's a lot of um, exposure due to a number of different entities within the business that maybe aren't necessary, but you want to maintain market presence with talent. So you unwind those structures, but take that HR talent and put them onto our vehicle and we, we maintain them for you until such time as you decide what it is you want to do. So there's a litany of different ways that it can be used. But in saying that, it's, you know, if you'll, you'll recall um, the artist formerly known as former President Trump, uh, he, uh, he canceled the H-1B visa program in the United States um, about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, obviously that's coming back online now. But when that happened, it was a jolt to uh, the tech sector, particularly in the United States, who were using that schema to bring over engineers to the United States. And um, when they couldn't get the talent, it's not like the need went away. So they used uh, our vehicle to, to attract and retain the talent in the particular regions. And we see this quite a lot. A lot of companies, you know, they, they want to get um, into a particular market. They, they can't travel or they can't get visas or there's you know, a nationalist bent to some of the immigration policies. So we can help them to, uh, to hire, and that's agnostic to, um, to uh, industry. Thanks, Charles. So um, another question, just again, for you around the turnaround time. So just in general, what's typically the, the kind of turnaround time you're looking for from initial contact, 
getting started working with you to having somebody on the ground operational in country? Yeah, look, it's the, the onboarding experience is, is extremely automated. So we have a platform that we use that in every country we operate, we have a locally compliant labor contract um, that's ready to go. So you uh, basically pull the trigger and because we're already an existing business in said country, the onboarding time is um, generally speaking a product of us simply complying with local statutory requirements, right? So in as little as 12 hours, um, some countries, you know, it, it takes longer because you have to register with the Ministry of Manpower. You have to get, maybe if it's a regulated business, we have to get some certifications for um, uh, the individual on behalf of the firm, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's, you know, typically, if I were to, you know, call out a, a timeline, it's a couple of days. Um, and our, our cycles are pretty quick because as I say, I mean, it's not, we're not going into a place and setting up. We're already there. So we're simply in the eyes of the authority, we're just hiring another employee. So it's, it's extremely straightforward. And we do this for mom and pop shops, you know, that's, that want to experiment for the first time. Maybe it's a, you know, a cool little uh, uh, noodle shop in Jakarta and they've decided they want to open up in San Francisco and they put somebody on the ground and we do that. And it's companies that are, you know, fortune 50 that are exploring uh, into a new market for the first time, or maybe they, they left a market and they want to go back in, but they're not ready to fully invest. Um, there's a whole range of uh, stories in that regard, but time to value is the key uh, sort of um, metric that uh, I, I measure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic in terms of the, the time savings, just because everything is set up. Okay, um, Steve, just one for you. Um, so the, the attendee is just looking to try and understand, are you only working or specializing with coming from the UK to Asia? Or also, is it intra or within ASEAN as well? I think that kind of came up earlier as well. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, our, our, first of all, we don't just work with UK companies. I, I just happen to be British. We, we work from companies coming to Asia from all over the world. So our scope typically will be, from India up to Japan and down to New Zealand. That's sort of where our coverage from an execution standpoint. And of course, Southeast Asia and intra Asia is, is a core part of that. So the, so the answer is yes, um, but it's not just intra ASEAN, it's, it's intra Asia. And then, you know, we have many scenarios where we have companies from Asia, especially through the Microsoft network that want geo expansion assistance, for example, in the US <clears throat> and, you know, for us, that's where we lean on our, on our other similar type companies to, to lean on. I think there was someone on this call that's one of our partners in, 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 in Europe that, that provides a similar service. But from, from our, our point of view, yeah, ASEAN and Asia, but, but that, that's a remit. Brilliant. So look folks, uh, just in the interest of time, I think we are good on uh, questions. So thank you very much everybody for, for those and for answering them, Charles and Steve. Let me just wrap up for today. Uh, thank you again for just giving your time today and to Globalization Partners for your support of the webinar. Um, we do have some great webinars coming up from the British Chamber of Commerce. You can see some of them here. So we've got Carbon catch, Capture, um, we've got a Leaders in Business Lunch, and then the key one is really the International Women's Day, um, which is happening on the 4th of March. And there are some uh, supporting partnership opportunities available, so please do reach out to the British Chamber if you're interested. Um, we will send out a feedback form as well, just to get a sense of whether this was useful and how useful it was. And in the meantime, uh, I wish everybody a good evening and I hope everybody stays safe. And thank you again for joining us. Take care, everyone.